Welcome back, my friends, to the sweet spot where IT leaders share their insights with other IT leaders and others that want to lead. My name is Carlos Vargas. As and every week, I have here my two co-hosts, Paul Lewis and Howard Holton. Hey, guys. Hey, hey now. What's new this week? Um, I don't know. Apparently, I don't smile enough, which is, <laughs> is caused, I think, by the, by the beard covering, because this is normal. This is smiling. <laughs> yeah, it's almost exactly the same. It's almost exa it's the advantage to facial hair. People can't really see your true expression. <laughs> that's all right. That just goes. Interesting. It makes me wonder if maybe that's the reason why people with facial hair weren't trusted for so long. Like that stigmata <laughs> was around. You need to go bold so at least we can see a, f a frown or a, a furlough. I need to do what? <laughs> go bold. Take it all off. No. No, no. You know, that would be interesting. How I come one week with hair, the next week, no hair. <laughs> right. no, it will not. It will not be interesting. We need to get <laughs> like a like a poll or something. Put some money on it for how no. much it will go. I don't think you could raise enough money to get <laughs> I'm 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 fairly certain. It grows back. Uh it does, but it's taken a very long time to get this length. That's true. And my family doesn't like me when I'm when I'm, you know. Well shorn. <laughs> well shorn. I've had a bad week, my friends. Yesterday, I've done the one thing I vowed never to do in my entire life, which was cancel a Disney vacation. <laughs> Shocking that I've had to do that. August you okay? 31st. August 31st, eight nights, you know, a splendid vacation with all the parks. Eight days worth of parks, and I couldn't do it. Wow. Too many limiting factors. I had to cancel it up. Wow. Now, so in fairness, Air Canada that very morning canceled the flights to actually go to Disney. <laughs> <laughs> so I would have had to driven, which would have not been a, you know, a fun experience. It's only 22 and a half hours, but it's a lot longer than you want it to be. So I had to cancel which means I now don't have a summer Disney trip. And I have to wait until March, potentially, to have a vacation. So, you could take a non-Disney vacation. No, impossible. <laughs> what, do you, what, do you want me to travel around Ontario in a caravan? No. Yes, please. Can you blog it the whole way? I think it would be hilarious. You want to rent an RV and go campsite to campsite? I think that would be great. It's almost like Disney. I just want the audio snippets. <laughs> the best ride we've got, kids. Would you knock it off? <laughs> I, so, I actually see it very similar to that Robin Williams movie, RV. Yeah, that was a great movie. It's on my list. It's on my list of rewatching. If it's on the TV, I'll keep it on. Yep, me too. So now I have to, I'm not going to experience the awesomeness of uh, wearing a mask the entire time in uh, 40 degree heat uh, in high humidity in Florida. I feel bad about that. I thought that would have been fun. And the small occupancy and, you know, none of the restaurants being open and not being able to park hop. All those awesome things I'm going to miss. It's, uh, it's disappointing. So it looked like you took then a lot of time from yesterday to today thinking about it. Yes. yes it's still on my mind. In fact, I might take Monday off just to, just to mourn. <laughs> You might take our company holiday off. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> and we did spend time on our math. Math's important. So uh, before we get into that topic, I kind of want to do to do a shout out. Um, sure. We've talked a lot about leadership. We've talked a lot about how COVID has made the job of leadership harder. And I kind of want to have a shout out. Um, I, you know, we, we, we have Monday off and Monday is not a, this is not a calendared holiday that, you know, was on our calendars as of January 1st, but rather um, our company has de decided with, with kind of the strangeness we've encountered, a mental health day is probably in order. Um, and, and I think it's worth kind of taking a moment and just kind of shouting out and saying, not only is it appreciated, but it's probably something other leaders should really look for. If your company doesn't support taking a, a day off company-wide, maybe think about what you can do for your teams to support a team building day, to support an activity, 
um, or some sort of rolling mental health day for the teams. It'd be a great idea. And definitely focus on, you know, family building day too, right? Because it's easy to work 6 a.m. to midnight. Very easy when you do that at home. Um, and therefore, in many ways, you want to you wanna force the discipline of spending more time with your family, whatever that means. It might mean, you know, sending pizza to everybody's houses that day. Whatever you think makes sense for your business is, is I think, would be appreciated. All right, let's get into our, our uh, Mickey Mouse adventure. So Mickey Mouse math. We spent quality time putting this graph together and it's probably, yeah, you know, I don't know, four or five weeks worth of time. Uh, we've done all the appropriate research. <laughs> all the appropriate research. The numbers are, you know, to the 10th decimal. Like it is detailed in terms of the kind of math we need to go through. Uh, but it is interesting. It's You're interesting. You started this yesterday afternoon. Um, and we do, we do in fact find it interesting. <laughs> we do, we do find it interesting, but it, but it, it, you know, I'm disappointed that I'm not going cause I wanted to see this live. Uh, but <laughs> we still read a lot and everything that's happening in a Walt Disney world opened on the 15th and the 17th, all four parks. And we've seen sort of the impact of wait times and the impact of crowds. Uh, and what I found most interesting, uh, let's see if anybody guesses here. What was the longest line so far um, at Disney World? Longest line so far? The Jungle Cruise. Nope. The Star Wars thingy. Nope. Well, you, those are boarding groups, so the line, line doesn't matter. Uh, I will give you a hint. It is not a ride. The Dole Whip booth. It is not a restaurant. <laughs> the bathroom. Not a bathroom. The train? It is a gift shop. Wow. Which gift shop? Cinderella's gift shop? Splash Mountain's gift shop. Oh, because Splash Mountain's being retired. Correct. Oh, that makes so, total sense. So all the souvenirs and tchotchkes, anything that has to do with the existing Song of the South, right? All brer rabbits and brer foxes and brer bears, they're just out. Like they have limited supplies now. Wow. What's odd, and, and like there are like hour long lines, like it's almost impossible to even get in there. Uh, but what's interesting is that it's a year away, like the change of, of Splash Mountain to, um, to Princess and the Frog is like a year or more away. The likelihood that they're going to refresh this stock in a year is kind of high, right? So I'm not sure why there's this short term run on the product when there's a year's worth of product going to be shelved. But but that's what's happening. That is the longest line. Sometimes you can't get in it. But to be honest, it's not the, like the primary market of for tchotchkes from Disneyland has never really been the deal. Um, there's always been a secondary market for the, for the things that you can only get in the parks, yeah. always. Um, and, and I would imagine because the announcement came out, it probably drove up the secondary market pricing. Right. So there, there's probably, a lot of people, a lot of people walking away with, like boxes of the same thing to right. be resold in the future at once they're not available. Yeah. I wonder how Disney actually feels about that. Um, I think they see it as a revenue opportunity. I would have, right? Yeah. Uh, what's the likelihood the prices increase in that store over time? Probably There's high. Stores for souvenirs around that are not Disney stores that actually carry the products from inside the park, but they have a markup. Right. Well, everybody's got to make their money, right? But I thought that was interesting of all the, all the possible lines. And for the most part, with the exception of Hollywood Studios, the lines have been very, very small, like 15 minutes and smaller. Um, uh, like the three big new rides at, at Hollywood Studios, you know, pushing the numbers up high. Um, and it's, you know, in fairness, it's a smaller park as compared to the others, but it, so far, so good. I think they're meeting their capacity requirements. I think it's been um, some forethought on their part that they opened up so much later than Universal, right? Universal has been open since what, June 4th, June 5th. Uh, so they've get, uh, to get to see uh, like a month's worth of experience. And I bet they had people in those parks, right? To see what the lines look like, see what the restaurants look like and use that data and bring it back to Disney and make their own decisions. 
So we, so we spent some time, we put some math together, um, as you can see on our fourth window, which we rarely have unless we have an interview. We're calling it the Mickey Mouse math. And we know that they spend a good portion of their time on math, on crowd experience, on optimal wait times, on, on pricing of both their products and their dining, prices of their packages, uh, what their crowds are gonna look like. They wanna move and create experiences for those crowds. So we know math is very important at Disney. They probably have a very large business analytics team. Uh, so we know that they're trying to still maintain guest satisfaction, uh, maintain or increase revenue. Uh, and of course the new health and safety guidelines they have to put in place, uh, making sure there are, there are likely more cast members doing more cleaning than they're used to and therefore they have to balance all that out. So we did some math. Let's see, uh, let's see if we can run through it and have a little discussion. Okay, so we know based on um, a variety of, of uh, other sites that contain this information, uh, if we look just one of the parks, in fairness, it's the biggest park. Uh, and as we know, um, you could take Disneyland uh, California, uh, California Adventure, and the parking of those two parks, and that fits in the parking of Magic Kingdom. So we know in terms of magnitude of size, Magic Kingdom's relatively big. Uh, you can't drive up to Magic Kingdom. You have to park and then take the monorail or the boat to Magic Kingdom, right? You have to, you have to cross the water in order to get there. So it does have a maximum capacity and that maximum would be like Christmas day of 100,000 guests. That is a lot. It's a lot of people in the individual park. Um, however, on average, if you look average throughout the year, it's much closer to 55,000, which is half of the peak, which is still, still pretty high. I've seen lows of 30, uh, and I've never once been at 100K, right? I've never once been where they've closed at 930. I don't know, Howard, have you been there when they closed at 930? N not to Florida, but I've been there. I've, <laughs> I've been to California where they've been at max. Did you ever get sent away? I, I did not. No, okay. So you got it. I've never been sent away. Which is I don't know if that's fortunate or unfortunate. Is the experience when that like when they're when they re reach max capacity, the experience is not good. No, it's it's I can't see it's how it's worth even going. It's not. Yeah, and let, now Disney World has all the fast pass. Um, well, at least they used to. They don't right now, <laughs> but where you could you know book your fast passes. So at least you get on those three rides, but you can't at the moment. Okay, so they they have opened, um, and we know that Shanghai Disney opened with a thirty percent of max capacity. Now, Shanghai Disney doesn't have 100,000 people, but the number almost doesn't matter. If we just assume 30% is at least the starting number, uh, we can sort of apply that 30% and see what the impact of Disney World's going to be. Okay, next, next button. Okay, uh, so we know that Disney um, has a strict understanding that uh, the average wait time on a ride uh, maximizes the guest satisfaction. Right, so uh, any longer um, and they're dissatisfied. Any shorter, they're dissatisfied, right? So we've got to, they, they have this optimal number uh, and that optimal number actually is created uh, depending on how many rides are in the park. In Magic Kingdom, it's 70% of the guests accommodated per hour, which means if there are 100,000 people in the park, um, there should have enough rides to accommodate 70,000 people riding on a ride per hour. Now, there isn't a park that accommodates 70,000 people, uh, which is why when you hit those maximums, they're not actually a, a whole bunch of satisfied people. But 70% is the number. Uh, now we know that you can't possibly accommodate the same number of, the same number today as you did in January, because now we have social distancing guidelines. They're only doing every other ride or every other row they're cleaning far more often. Their rides are actually slower than they have been in the past in order to accommodate those things. Uh, there's no fast pass lines, but the lines, the traditional lines go out uh, three or four times longer than they would have before. Uh, so which means the capacity is probably, but we don't know this exactly, about half of the current capacity, right? So they can accommodate half the amount of people in that ride per hour as they could before. Okay. So if that's true, then a normal ride capacity, in other words, in an average time would be 38 and a half guests, 38 and a half thousand guests per hour, right? B 
give or take, which would be 38 and a half is about uh, 70 percent of 55,000, right? 55,000 being the total. If we think that the COVID ride capacity is 19,000 guests per hour because of that math, um, then it's only actually giving you a 63% uh, of those guests accommodated on rides. So if they were to stick with a 30% capacity, they would actually not be satisfying the amount of guests that they actually need to, which means it's much more likely to be less than 30% it's much more likely to be 50% of their average, which would give or take about 27,000. 27,000 guests, um, if you take 70% of that, can be accommodated in half of the capacity that they have at Magic Kingdom right now. So we're looking give or take um, at 27% of the total capacity or 50% of the average capacity. That's what we think is true. Howard, color commentary on those, on those numbers. I mean, I mean, I think all in all, that's interesting, right? We're talking about an organization that's a highly mechanized organization, right? All of the rides are mechanical, um, electromechanical, but mechanical. Um, and then uh, we're also looking at a system where um, even given three months of being closed, I haven't seen any evidence that, and, and it's not like I have a connection with Disney, but, but in, in the, 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 things that are produced by, by Disney fans. I haven't seen any evidence that they've drastically increased um, automation of cleaning events, mm. right? Or changed the way ride dynamics work to support the additional cleaning, right? Like instead of, instead of bringing all of the, you know, the kind of two rows of, of carrying, you know, of, of, of ride cars forward, um, where they do that, that, that goofy mix to kind of reshuffle them time and time again, Right. Um, shutting down one lane, emptying out the other, then shutting that lane down, then starting this one, right? So they have the time to clean in between while maintaining uh, roughly the same or similar, uh, you know, ride capacity. Or um, in the space in between where a ride empties and where it starts, which doesn't, isn't supported on all the rides, right? Automating, um, you know, some of the cleaning process. I haven't seen, I haven't seen anything like that. And I find that, I ultimately find that to be a, a very interesting component. Hmm. Um, I also haven't seen, you know, like, like more directional pathways throughout the park, hmm. right? Which I also think would, would help quite a bit, right? Um, you know, theoretically, if we're, if we're walking um, back to front to back to front, like if we're, if we're effectively in line throughout the totality of the park, um, you know, that would, you know, that, that would affect social distancing, right? That would make social distancing more effective. Right. If, if, uh, if I'm staring at your back and, and my breath exhalation containing the, the COVID, COVID um, you know, hits the back of your head, it's a far less, far less likely you're going to get affected than if it hits your face. <laughs> right. So, so I, I kind of, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious about like, what, what do you, what have you seen in the park experience where, you know, people where you've seen video of people going through the park, like there was that guy that published two and a half or three hours of his experience on, on right. He did a walkthrough. Yeah. Right. Um, like, what have you seen that made you go, oh, that's different, that's new, and that's interesting, other than the fact that people were wearing masks and there weren't as many people in the park? Well, they did the social distancing markers within the rides, sure. uh, which, which I think is helpful. Um, and I think the difficulty is with everything you're saying, and especially on the automation, is there's still a guest to cast member ratio that they have to maintain. Right? It's not like they're going to bring back all 50,000 cast members and have them all working at the same time when they have only you know, 27,000 actual guests in there, which means they have significantly less people, probably you know, a quarter of the people they normally would, and therefore they still have to operate the same rides with the same level of safety as they did before, which means we've, given, we've put sort of extra work on them to do manual cleaning when they need to in between those rides. So I think the automation, the, certainly the, the people impact is affecting whether they can add the level of automation that we think would be valuable or not. Um, I am seeing that um, they're better at the characters because there's no in-person characters, they're doing character pop-ups, right? They're putting characters on lawns that you can't reach. They're putting characters on horseback, ride. Right? 
So they're going up and down Main Street. Uh, they're putting characters up in windows, right? So the characters, oddly enough, are in fact more available than they have been before, and they can seem be, be seen by more people. You're not just sitting, but you're not standing beside them taking pictures with them. Which is so the, the, that's interesting because the character experience was the thing that ruined Disneyland for me more than anything else. Really? Um, yeah, because we had a little one, right? Yeah. And the the character experience was generally awful. Um, you're waiting in line to get your picture. No, don't mind the wait in line. The wait in line is not the problem. The <laughs> the the other guests pushing their way into line. Ah, uh, right. That was a problem. The, 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 the lack of like crowd management. And I, I understand there's a fine line between, you know, full enforcement and, you know, ticking people off enough that they have a bad experience. Right. You, you kind of always lose in that case. Right. Mm. Um, and, and it was really just kind of the character experience and the time that it takes brings out the worst in certain types of people. That's true. Right? My kid doesn't want to wait. And so it becomes a big problem. And, and the fact is nobody's kid wants to wait. So by removing that interaction, um, you know, personally, I th it would have done a lot for me and people like me who, who are really annoyed by the opportunities for, you know, bad people to be bad people. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're flybys. I, I like that you get to see more characters, even if you don't get to spend one-on-one -on -one time with an individual character. I think the variety is more important than the individual. But in that fairness, I'm not, I'm not a six-year-old girl, right? So I'm not sure whether the, you know, the princess meeting was just as important to me. Now, I had a six-year-old girl. Pardon? That was our problem. We went with, yeah. the, with our little one. Yeah. It was, there were lines with the problem that Howard mentioned, but if they have been more opportunities to at least allow him to see them, it would have been a lot better. Because mm -hmm. they have favorites. And it's more than one, right? There's a variety yeah. of favorites and a variety of brands, and they want to be able to see them all. Yeah. Pluto oh, yeah. was everywhere. Pluto was there. Only once at a time, though. Yep. You never see more than one Pluto in the same site. <laughs> um, so do, do we think they're going to increase this capacity in a short period of time, or they're going to maintain this capacity for the foreseeable future? I, I certainly hope they don't try to increase it within the first two weeks. Right. Right. Because within the first, we need two weeks to be able to, to see kind of what the infection rate is. And is it higher than the average infection rate? Like, like if the infection rate within Florida, as an example, is, is 3.3%. And I have no idea what it is, but it's, or it's, it's whatever it is, 33,000 people a day. Like it's some insane number. If that, if that, if the, in the next two weeks, that spikes to 38,000, and we right. can trace a number of those people back to Disney, you know, a larger percentage per capita back to Disney, then we probably need to think about those numbers not being right. At the same time, if we trace it back and go, those numbers, those numbers do seem to be right, then I think we take two tacks. One, we think about increasing that capacity, and two, we try to figure out why, mm. right? And then what is the right number? And, and uh, in in some cases, this is I, I don't think we have enough data to be to be really scientific about it, right? Um, what I would look at is is things like where do you spend an hour or more currently, um, and and I would look at those locations and see like what does their capacity look like, what does their distancing look like, right? What does their number of humans per square foot look like, right? Or per you know hundred square feet look like, um, and I think that would give us a really really good idea of what, what we could sustain and what we cannot sustain. I think at the very least, regardless, uh, it's gonna go for the full length of this year, right? I, I don't think any dramatic change to those capacity numbers are gonna occur till January. Um, and I think that's true just because they stopped most bookings until recently, until next year's bookings anyway. So, so anybody who had vacation may or may not take their vacation but that'll be the maximum potential capacity. Sure. Yeah. sure. It would have been interesting to see rather than cancel if you could have sold someone else your vacation. <laughs> that, that would be interesting. They don't make that easy. Right? It's not like you get tickets. To, it's not a transferable sure. activity. And they do ask for your name and child's names and dates. Like it's very specific. Sure. Yeah. But you'd think there'd be a, like, especially now, you'd think there'd be a method, right? Like, you know, if, if getting here from a foreign country is especially difficult, yeah. 
right? You'd think there would be some, some methodology for doing that. Or maybe there's a lottery that you enter. So if people cancel, you can pick up one of the cancellations. That, that would be nice. It's in their best interest to ultimately maintain exactly what that number is because that number is lower than the average daily value. Right. Anyhow. Right. Uh, there is something like that because there are companies in the around the Florida area that you get the tickets extremely cheap to go and visit something else. So I'm like, go and visit this timeshare and we will give you your Disney tickets for like $20. Right. And I'm, there's no way that they can, you can get them that cheap unless that there's something like that, that they have some type of agreement that if there's yeah. something available that they can get it. I've done the, the timeshare thing in Florida before, you know, go watch a timeshare so you can buy cheaper Disney tickets and they're not that much cheaper. Hmm. Like I'm sure I, there's probably one or two, right. But that are sub that are that heavily subsidized, but but all the ones that I found, the discount was like 15 bucks off a ticket or something, 20 bucks off a ticket. And it's already $120. Right. It's a ridiculously Canadian. priced ticket. So, you know, getting that, getting that ticket price down was, I don't know, maybe worth the hour and a half to two hours, even though it's actually, they, t they tell you it's a one hour presentation. No, it's like four and a half hours. <laughs> right. And now they're forcing you to go with your family. Not yeah, that's you. what they did when we went too. Yeah. If, if a husband and wife is in town, the husband and wife have to go. Like, oh, no, they wanted my kids. Well, my kid wasn't with us, so, so that wasn't a problem. Like, they you, they wanted to impress the kids? Kid with us? No, she's not, she's not traveling to Florida with us. They, they wanted the kid bothering you, and we saw it after the fact, because the kid's bothering you, and then when he's bothering you, then you buy, because you just yeah. want to get the heck out of it. You want to get out of there. <laughs> nice. But will That's it be good. interesting that there is enough technology already that they can figure out some of this information? Like those wristbands that yeah. have the RFID chips that they use for the photos or other stuff? Yeah, magic bands. Yeah, the magic bands. So there may be probably a way to gather information where the people are congregating it and, and seeing if something is happening after the fact. Oh, they definitely have all that information. Yeah, because yeah, they have some RFID sensors that are like 15 feet away, like that, they can detect that, that kind of motion. You don't actually have to scan it on the thing. Uh, you just do it because it's part of the fun, right? It's not actually a mandatory requirement. And, and I'm like, they've had so many video cameras in place. They have to be doing video analytics. Yeah, they absolutely have to. I, I, and it would shock me to find out that they weren't, but, but let's, let's kind of, let's dig into that a little bit. So, yeah. so, um, you know, World Health Organizations, not just the WHO, but, but other organizations, um, and those that study, um, you know, viruses, um, virologists, uh, have commented that, that this is going to become more and more common, especially as we start to push the envelope of how many people you at, the, the world can sustain, right? how many living humans we can sustain. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think going forward, um, large theme parks, large things like a Disneyland, right? It's a very, very good example. Um, should do to help encourage better habits, help encourage better safety, help create environments that have better safety. Like, what are some some like? I'd like to see automatic dispensers on, you know, when the when the rides stop, right? Like, like instead of having one stage where you step off the ride to the left and new people step into the right side of the car. Right, it's now it's now a separate experience. I you step off fifty feet ahead, people are stepping on, and in the in the fifty feet in between, they have an automatic dispenser that 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 sprays a you know a disinfectant, or right. you know more use of materials that are naturally antibiotical, like mm. like copper and silver is a good example. But there's also some plastics and some glasses that are that are antibacterial. Like, what are some things you'd like to see that you think would make a difference in you know, overall in that in that experience? I think if they uh, create some individualism in the, um, not just the ride, it, ride itself, but the ride experience. So, you, you know, you spend most time with people in the line. Uh, so how do we create individualism in that line? They've done it with things like test track, where they stop you in order for you to perform some activity before you go to another stop to perform another activity. That slows you down and puts you in groups, at least the groups to which you're with, you know, you you double click a couple of buttons, it's, you segregate yourself into different rooms, uh, which I think would be effective. They could do that more. So instead of waiting in an hour line, all huddled together, 
that there's some segregation right at the front where you're already in a family setting instead of standing in a line for an hour and then getting into your family setting. I think they could do that. Um, I think they could use the space that they have, like make sure it's a, a little bit of a longer walk from ride to ride to ride, more Epcot-like than Magic Kingdom-like. And that'll space people out for the most part. Um, I think they could do far more outdoor seating than they do. There's a lot of indoor seating. I could think they could create far more outdoor seating to support that and then move them a little bit separately. Um, and then far more um, like food trucks, right? Uh, that kind of experience instead of restaurant experience, instead of going up to the side of a building and ordering something, you should have lots of different options with lots of different segregation and separation. I think that would be valuable. And I would say make the, make the park less obvious in terms of path, right? There's an obvious There's an obvious path, path in, all the path, in all the parks. Yeah. yeah. If you take out the obviousness of that and require you to actually, you know, make a decision to go to a specific ride, the more likelihood you'll you'll congregate less. You won't it won't be a line. It won't at least a perceived line. Sure, sure. It's um it's it's a effectively action economy. Right? Um, yeah. yeah, it's a gig economy. Well well it's 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 action economy, right? How do I how do I how do I define the number of actions you're going to take in a day? Right. And then how do I ensure you take them in a different order that everyone else that than everyone else will want to take them? Mm -hmm. right? And we used to, like, I used to have fun with that at, at Disneyland California because um, you get there when the park opens and it's kind of a mad rush to the same, the same four individual locations. It's the two closest rides and the two furthest rides. Right. Right. And, and so you would learn after about a hundred, you know, over the course of a hundred visits, like it's actually this ride. And then you run to the other side of the park and you do this ride. And then the other side of the park and you do this ride. And there was this whole like action economy that would occur. Right. Th that seemed completely illogical, but it was really about moving opposite of how the crowd hops from one to the next, to the next, to the next. And I, I think, I think to, to kind of double click on what you said, I think that if, if Disney or any other theme park, were to think about that action economy, not in the sense of what's most efficient for physical layout, right? How do I take, how do I pack the most stuff in the stuff in the least amount of space, mm -hmm. but rather how do I interrupt some percentage of the path at each opportunity, right? right. How do I, instead of providing one path, how do I provide two? Maybe I'm only gonna split off 30% of people, but then where 66% are going, I put two food trucks, now I've split off another 10 or 15%, right? Right. And all I'm doing is changing, is slowing that wave into a whole bunch of different ripples. Because ripples I can handle. Big waves, te I tend not to be able to handle. Right. What do you do if it's something like a sports event? I, I actually think you do the same thing because you have the same ripple effect, right? Um, you have the same... Um, this thing occurred, it creates a natural break. Now everyone's going to rush to the bathroom. Now everyone's going to rush to get some food, food item, some drink, some thing, right? And, and sporting events are great because they're, they're not, there's very little forced physical layout in a sporting event, right? Like I have rings, but those rings don't really contain the restaurants. They contain a, the facility to bolt a restaurant onto the concrete that exists there, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I were to break that up into a bunch of food carts, if I were to break that up into a bunch of micro experiences, right, then I can better support those sort of activities. And then if I were to add in um, an app experience, it becomes a really, really good kind of kind of thing, right? Turn the app on when you get to the, when you, when you get there, make sure notifications are enabled and the app looks for movement. Hey, you just right. got up and are walking out of your seat. If you're headed to the bathroom, we recommend going this way. Mm -hmm. If you're headed to get food, what click what fun, kind of food you want. We'll tell you where the shortest line is. I think I think because those are so much more captive and they're so much more constrained on on space, it's much much easier. Like you won't, you really don't have 25 activities. You have two activities: the sport, the sport itself, and not the sport. <laughs> right. Right. And, and, and of the, not the sport, it almost doesn't matter. Like you can literally create a decision tree that, that asks people what to do. Yep. Right. I, I, I can't ask for the same thing at, at conferences. We go to conferences a lot. And I asked, why do you not have an app that shows me where the hell the crowd is and how long it's going to take to get to my next event 
and what path I should take. Because everyone takes exactly the same path. Right. So why not tell me, hey, you're not going to make it. Hey, there's 97,000 people in that hallway. Why don't you pick this hallway instead? Yes, it's longer, but there's only 12,000 people there. It's much, much faster. Yeah. I also think they could use the app to take the decisions away, right? To say, instead of you thinking about what ride you want to go in next and then making your way to that ride, it's just telling you to say, you know what? Your next best ride, this one. And here's the path. Go there, go there now. And then you well, can just follow the recommendations the entire day. I thought that's where they were going with FastPass when they first came out with it. Yeah. Right? Like in, in 2008, 2009, when, when we really kind of started to wickedly adopt phones and we were looking at the app being the next greatest thing, I right. thought for certain that was going to be it. So you get there, you, like as soon as you get in the park, your app, your app pops up and goes, hey, you know, you're in the parking lot. Hey, you're 33 minutes away from the gate. Would you like to start adding fast passes now? And you just see what rides you want to run a ride. Click all the rides you want to ride. And it goes, yep. bing, we have optimized your fast pass experience. Right. Here's your new route, right? Like when do you want to have lunch? You just set those barriers. And then as long as you maintain that path, it happily, you're, you're happily allowed on. Your fast pass always works. Right. And if I could do that for two thirds of the park, the experience would always be a balanced experience. Every ride would have a balanced number of riders. It would take a, it would take the same amount of time, right? And it would, and, and ultimately what we're aiming for is predictability, right? I want, I want the, the line to always be exactly 37 minutes long, not sometimes it's 12, sometimes right. it's an hour and 45 minutes. Right. Right. And that sort of stuff would, would certainly enable that. Or, or even like, you don't even have to do it that. You could just do, as soon as you're done with your ride, you click and it says, Hey, if you can be here in seven minutes, you can have a fast pass. Right. Right. Like you could make it interactive. You don't even have to make it super totally completely prescribed. You could make it more interactive. And then people will be like, no, I'm going on a break. I'm not going to click that button. In Shanghai, Disney, uh, as soon as you walk in, uh, your app provides you with a list of uh, day options, right? Is this a family day, family A, B, and C? Is this an adventure day? Is this an excitement day? It's essentially, narrowing down the amount of fast passes that makes sense for you. And then you can pick what your day's like. And then it says, okay, great. Now you have eight fast passes and they're there for these rides and this is the order you should do them in. So, so you're do, not forced to, do but- they have a, Do they have a CTO day? Because that was <laughs> a pretty not. awkward, that was a pretty unique experience, I have to say. <laughs> it was, it was, it's, it was fun to go on, um, on, on rides or watch shows that were entirely a different language than you're used to and just well, watching everybody else laugh while you're wondering what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the stitch ride was pretty awkward because I got to that one before the rest of you. So I was in a total, like I was there by myself <laughs> right. as you know, the jolly American giant trying to figure out. And it was the only one that was, that was completely in, in Japanese. Yeah, the one that was like Turtle Talk with Crush, but Stitch. Yeah. 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 And that, that one was, that, I, I will say that one was awkward. <laughs> it was awkward. And I got 0% of the jokes. I got 0% of the humor. I got, and there was nobody, like I couldn't awkwardly laugh with the rest of my group because there was none. <laughs> right. so I just got in, I got seated, and about 30 seconds in, I'm going, oh, this is a mistake. <laughs> you were hoping you weren't getting picked. <laughs> yes yes i was hoping i didn't have to be interactive yeah and it was very obvious that you could have been picked you were the standout oh yeah 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 i was, <laughs> I was taller and and more distinctive <laughs> more distinctive yeah. yes but i'm certain i'm certain what happens is the person looks and goes oh look there's somebody distinctive oh that person looks entirely too lost for this to work <laughs> That's right. funny for me the rest of the audience probably won't <laughs> and that guest will not leave as a satisfied guest i'm certain now, knowing me, I would have had a great time with it. So well, how Carlos, do you bring this into company, into how IT interact with their customers right now. I I think this is an availability conversation, right? You you can call this ride availability, right? What it, what does it mean to be available? How important is availability to the guests? Um, and in the IT sense, it's the same kind of thing. Sometimes we struggle with performance versus availability, right? Sometimes we struggle whether what's more important, uh, sub-second response time or um, 
or that it's available 724. Um, and you can you can't do everything. It's kind of what it boils down to. Um, and then how would one calculate availability? Is availability from the perspective of the user, from the perspective of the device, from the perspective of the transaction, from the perspective of more than one part of the business? Maybe it's from web server back. Maybe it's just the storage. Like, does any of that matter? Um, and, and how important is availability as compared to any other illity? Uh, not just performance, but replaceability or, um, or the protection side of the business or yeah. security, right? Replaceability, sustainability, securability, yeah. right? Mo mobility. But I, I think it's, I, th I think it, it even goes a little bit deeper than that. And you kind of yeah. talked about it, right? And that is, um, figuring out what is actually important is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Right, and acknowledging that ultimately, just like Disney, right, maximizing guest satisfaction, they're not looking to maximize Disney satisfaction. Right. But they're looking to what makes the customer the happiest, and how do we attain that without killing ourselves? Right. How do we? How do we? How do we? You know, if if we're doing an order of operations, right, it's it's guest satisfaction multiplied by revenue, kind of thing. Right. Right. Like, the revenue still has to still still has to justify the guest satisfaction. So so what is how do we maintain high guest satisfaction? What does it cost for that satisfaction to find where the happy medium is? And and ultimately, I think we all have to think that way, right? IT has to think that way. What what does COVID look like for us? For Disney, this is what it looks like. And then, what is the measurement that matters in a COVID world? Mm. Right. The measurement that matters in a COVID world for Disney is. 70% of guests accommodated based on how many guests are in the park at that moment. Right. And so what is our metric that matters in a COVID world? What is our metric that matters in a digitally transformed world, in a digital world? Mm -hmm. And then how do we change what we do in IT so that that is what we keep in mind always? And I promise you, it's not calls per hour. I promise you, it's not tickets per hour. Right. Right, it's some combination of illities that combine together to equal customer satisfaction per dollar. Right, and the customer in that circumstance is either the internal business users and or the actual customers of the business themselves. One hundred percent, right? The the customer is is kind of a per application basis. Right, right. A, a feature by feature, application by application. How do they interpret satisfaction? Um, and, and it's going to vary, it's going to vary quite a bit. Now, now that doesn't mean you get super boutique, but it does mean that you need to understand that, you know, what a customer sees as usability and, and what makes a customer happy is different than what makes finance happy is different than what makes support happy is different than what makes sales happy. And in some way you have to balance all of those requirements, um, swizzle those together and produce an outcome or outcomes ideally that work for each of them. So has the availability requirement changed since January? So I, I think we've talked about this, right? The availability, I, I think before January, we were constantly chasing performance, mm -hmm. constantly. Now we're constantly chasing availability right. and securability, right? Um, I, think, I think we've even pushed, like it, it used to be, we, we, chased cup, um, we, we chased performance and we chased capacity. Mm. Right. How do I support more users with less and how do I give them a, a, a better, more responsive experience? And now it's how do I give them a better experience where it's some baseline of performance, but it's available everywhere. Right. Right. Performance doesn't go away. I can't click and wait 10 minutes. But at the same time, you know, I, I think the golden unicorn that we're that we're chasing is is in fact availability. So is availability an everywhere stat or an all the time stat? Yes. Yes, both of those things. It is. So it it's, is in fact it, both it's a mistake to choose one of them. It is in fact both. It is in fact both, and and I think that's where the trouble really started because we used to be able to box the time, right, right, and and be able to say, okay, like like we are doing maintenance during this window, we're doing backups during this window, we're doing activity Y, right, in in this window, and that's our window, and all of a sudden our window didn't just shrink; it went away. Mm -hmm. Right, because I have users legitimately that they have, you know, everybody's at home now. So 
they have needs that can't easily be pushed aside, which means things have to shift. And logically, if I'm not interfacing with a person that requires a specific time response, I can shift work to a later hour. I can be just as productive, if not more productive, but I'm going to do it at hours that the business previously had as their own rather than you know the users or the customers. And so I think it's very much a, how do I do, it's, it's kind of the same, how do I do more with less, but it's not how do I do more with less money, it's how do I do more with less time. Mm. Right. So how do I think about my application availability in a way that allows me to do backups? What does that mean, right? What is my new RPO RTO, right? Do I, do I continue to back everything up the same way that I did before, knowing that my application state doesn't necessarily change day to day to minute to minute, mm -hmm. right? Do I break out those roles so I can more, so I can make that more efficient, right? Now, now we can start getting into kind of a microservices conversation. Right, where before having all of that together in one box made sense because it was easy and it didn't really cost me anything. Now, maybe I break that out into a bunch of different roles because only the ones over here, only the ones over here need to be backed up and these ones are stateless, right? right. Shortening my backup time and allowing me to make a staggered backup window. So there's lots of dimensions. There's how do I make this individual application more available? Uh, it's how do I make more applications more available? It's also, how do I make my team more available? In other words, I have more people in my service desk and my help desk and more people ordering laptops, right? But that's a, a, another set of availability. Or what may have been a team, a, a team that was only required eight to five is now required from five to 10. Right, so I've now had to create shifts right. to support right. a, a, a sense of- How do of, I make that service more available? Right, so then in, in, in a real sense, how do I make an individual application more available? How do, how do I go from its current X nines to something, an order of magnitude greater nines? Uh, it depends application to application, right? Yeah. Well, it, it varies. Exactly. It, well, <laughs> um, I mean, I would start with more front ends without a doubt and, and more, more availability groups. Mm -hmm. Um, the where, where it starts to become challenging though is how do I handle applications that don't have the ability to be active active? Like active active tends to be a simple solution. How do I handle applications that don't have an active active? And, and I would say design for active active, right? How do I, how do I design all of the, the, the totality of the applications active active? And if I can't do that, how do I design pieces to be active active? And what do those individual pieces look like? And that's really kind of where I would start. Makes sense. There you go, Carlos, that was your IT answer. <laughs> well, it was very interesting to see how we took it from just looking at outside of IT world, just looking at rights and how similar challenges happen inside the IT world as a, and as leaders, how we can learn from what other areas are doing that have nothing to do with technology because we're interacting with people. Mm -hmm. We're all in the, in the business of working with people. So it doesn't matter if it's on a ride or with IT, at the end of the day, we're solving people's problems. So my friends, it's awesome to have you with us here. And as every week, make sure that you subscribe to our podcast, to our video lives, and that you share this with your team and family members so we can continue to grow with the leaders that we know that we can be. See you on our next episode, my friends. <laughs>